Um, so welcome everybody. Um, we've got a really, really informative uh, session lined up for you today, looking at why and how we unlock digitally enabled service improvement through user experience. And there's some really brilliant practical examples here. Um, and we're going to, well, let's start with some introductions first of all. Um, Nadia, do you want to go first and, and pass on the button? Sure, thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Nadia Kuftanov. I'm a user experience researcher and solutions designer at Surrey and Borders Partnership. Hi, I'm Alex Vaughan. I'm the health tech business analyst and solutions designer, also within Surrey and Borders Partnership. Hi, uh, my name's Liz Ashall Payne. I'm the founding CEO at Orca. And I feel like I just need to explain why I'm sat here because <laughs> um, people will know that Orca assess and approve digital health technologies and then deploy them through digital health formularies. But actually, a big part of our passion is it's not working. Sorry. Um, ah. <laughs> I am loud enough, actually. I probably don't need a mic. Um, but a, a, a big part of the passion at Orca, and actually for me as a clinician, was finding the right technology for the right person at the right point in their care. And so we're completely obsessed with user experience and making sure that we know which technologies meet whose need and make sure that healthcare professionals know how to get them to people. So I just felt that I needed to explain why I was sat here, because people may not necessarily have been able to join up those dots. Brilliant. So we're going to start off with a real-life example, and Nadia's going to talk us through what's, what's happening um, in Surrey. Thank you very much, Ros. Uh, so I'm going to uh, give you a little uh, use case of Surrey and Borders uh, and the health tech team, just to get the discussion ball rolling. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. I know it's the end of the day, and drinks are on the way. I'm trying to be lively and sparky. We'll get there together. Right, so I'm going to whiz through some of the things that we think about when we're looking at user experience as a means to unlock what we need to have happen to develop and improve services. So moving away from a one-size-fits-all model in the first instance, user experience can really help you determine what needs to happen to have a service that is inclusive, that will provide the same level of care uh, in, in a way that means it doesn't matter what situation you are in, what barriers you have, what challenges you experience as a person who uses our services, but how we are going to ensure that everyone is coming along on the same journey together and experiencing services in the same way. So when we say moving away from a one-size-fits-all model, we might want to implement one piece of technology across a trust, for example, but we're doing it in different ways and we're addressing different needs. The graphic here illustrates different stages of ensuring that everybody can access the service in the same way, but they have different needs. Now, some of you might be familiar with this graphic and think to yourself, well, the liberation one is new. And that's what I thought when I saw this. And it leads nicely into the next slide that I want to talk to you about. Should you always be looking to remove every single barrier and challenge and solve all of the problems? I know some of you are sat here thinking, Christ, I need to get on the phone to a supplier pretty quick. You don't have to because uh, you have to decide where your start and finish point is. And usually it's not where you think it's going to be pretty much 100% of the time. So we've got an illustrative model here that is based on uh, our processes within our health tech team about how we go about initiating projects. We thought that the start was at the start and the end was at the end. It was not. Actually, our starting point for certain projects is way before we thought it would be. And the end point is actually not where we thought it was, but it's not solving all of the problems in the world. It's solving a particular problem. It's addressing a specific issue. We're not trying to bite off more than we can chew. We're just looking in a different way at how we scope things so that we can address a problem really, really effectively. Um, we also find that having a lot of different skill sets within the team is very important. So we'll go into this in more detail in the next slide, but expect the unexpected. When you're thinking about user experience, you're not just thinking about user experience researchers and solutions designers. You're thinking about interpersonal skills, contract negotiation. All of these kinds of things play a role. Have people got experience with procurement? Have people got experience with working on the front line? All of these kinds of things will impact how you can implement user experience research into making services spot on. So, what is good user acceptance? Well, 
That's the million dollar question. You don't know until you go and find out. So we've got some examples here. What is the why? You have to understand that in the first instance. And the why is probably not going to be what you think it is at the start. The why will change. The why will have more whys. The whys will not be what you expect them to be. It's a known unknown, and you have to go out and find out for yourself. Uh, what does user acceptance look like? You have to define that, and everybody has to agree that that's what you're doing, otherwise it's going to get very messy very quickly. Um, so is something trying to get better? Are you trying to do something in a different way? Uh, are you just trying to get people to use something? Um, so defining those metrics is really, really important. Underneath there, quantitative and qualitative evaluation with user experience research is a lot of words to say, find out those things first, and then write a report that you can then take to people and it answers their questions about has something had an impact? And that's why finding out metrics early on is so important because people are gonna wanna know things like, does it save costs? Does it save lives? Does it improve things for people? Find out what people want to know before they ask the question, otherwise you're going to have to go back and find the answer. And that's fun. Uh, so do people want passive or active uh, technologies? I don't know, go find out. Like that's the beauty of user experience research. Like you will be surprised by what people want or what they don't want. And we have to be ready for the unexpected. And we have to admit in this world of digital health that the answer isn't always digital. I'm sorry to break it to you. Sometimes innovation comes in the form of doing things in a different way that doesn't necessarily implement digital technologies. And that's fine too. Um, by the way, the, the colleague that you see in all of the photos is called Marie. She is, uh, she's got the skill of photography and selfies, also very important uh, for us anyway. Um, so user research will answer questions. Uh, you've got to adopt and adapt what you're doing. Never think like, well, we did this in a similar service on the other side of the trust. No, won't work, different. Just go into something completely with new eyes and a fresh perspective and don't have any assumptions or be ready to have those assumptions challenged. Every day is a perilous adventure, it's fantastic. Um, look for assurance services as well. So Orca is a fantastic example because we have things like the NHS app library, but Orca reviews apps, it tells us on a scale, like, you know, what is good about them. Thank you, Liz, for being here today. And it just gives you that confidence that something is going to be safe and effective and you can trust it. Don't put your trust in absolutely anything out there. Look for assurances so that you know what you're doing. You can feel confident about implementing it. Uh, and also lessons learned are incredibly valuable. I'm sure we all know this already. I'm preaching to the converted, I'm sure. Um, but listen to colleagues as well. Find out what's going on. Don't be afraid to reach out. If you see somebody in another part of the country doing something, bother them. They'll probably be really appreciative that somebody has paid attention to what they're doing. Um, okay, so how do you facilitate and embed good user acceptance and innovation adoption? As I mentioned previously, it's that mixed skill set. What do you all bring to the table? What is everybody's strengths? What great things can people do that aren't necessarily what their job role is about, that adds like a special spicy flavor? Um, work collaboratively as well. We are split into two halves in our team. We've got the UX researchers and solutions designers and our change and adoption specialists. They're about training and engagement. We're about going and finding things out. But we work interchangeably because we're a small team and teamwork does in fact make the dream work. It's true. Um, and you can see more of Marie here <laughs> as well. I thought it was important that she is with us uh, spiritually and emotionally. Um, That's not us. I'll just go back to our slide. <laughs> so thank you very much. And uh, over to the panel now. That was, that was really brilliant. I loved it. What you did was made user research feel like an adventure, didn't you? It's like you never know what's going to happen next. It's an adventure. <laughs> it's an adventure. What a brilliant <laughs> adventure it can be as well. Um, and you reminded me, um, so I, I head up a, um, an inclusive co-design team, and you reminded me of a, a, a something that happened recently where we were working with a group of young people to co-design um, you know, a prototype for um, uh, how we might help um, reduce inpatient admissions to CAM services. Um, and uh, we had been given the task of looking at the sort of, you know, the crisis point. And we started this piece of co-design and the young people went, 
hold on a minute, hold on a minute, actually crisis is too late, you need to be working on pre-crisis and they changed the course of that piece of co-design right from the beginning and not, not only that, I was, I was telling you guys the other day that um, we, actually they presented the end result to the National um, uh, uh, Task Force and it made such a big difference that they were owning it, they were in control and they were presenting it, it, it to the, the CAMS Task Force and I think they were really heard um, so, you know, that, yeah, it was an example of it going completely off in a different direction to what, what the, the system, if you like, intended, and I'm really glad that it did. So, on that note, I think it's really, the, the sort of, you talked a bit about the skill sets um, and, and, and so on, and I think underneath you also talked a little bit about values as well. And I was going to ask Alex a little bit more about, you know, what do you, what do you think of the sort of, if, you know, if you're going to go down this route, what would your advice be for other people about the team? You know, what skill sets do you need? What values do you need? What kind of culture do you need to have there? Sure. I mean, from our experiences, our health tech team um, that Nadia and I are part of, we actually came together as a bit of an experiment. And originally, there was four of us. And my colleague Marie, myself, another colleague, Helena, um, and a, a, a gentleman called Mark, we were the original four. And we literally started off going, we'll start off with a nice little project, we'll see how it goes, we'll learn, and see where we go. And the skill sets we all brought in was Mark and ex-clinician, um, data scientist was here, and then Marie's change adoption, and myself, um, technology and, uh, and solutions and business development. And the journey we've had and the skill sets of coming together is that it's actually about going out. So you, and it's always being willing to listen and to understand what people are trying to achieve and the outcomes we're trying to get to. So those skill sets need to come together. And that mix, which sounds so strange, comes together really well because you bounce off each other, you learn from each other, and then you can go talk to people. And when we go, we go out in the front line, so you saw lots of photos of us in our blue shirts, our Isarian Borders polo shirts, and we do that because that's what our clinicians wear, that's what our HCAs wear, that's what our cleaners wear. So we go out and we, and we go talk, and we want to hear what everyone has to say because everyone has something important to say. And actually, that one piece of kit, so we rolled out remote monitoring, everything that people said had an impact, even to the extent of going, there was a concern around when we clean under the beds, how will that affect the system? And actually, that raised a whole debate, going, do we need to mark up the walls? Do we need to be able to do this? So those conversations can only happen because we have those different skill sets. We are willing to learn and bounce off each other. And actually, is go out and go, we don't have the answers. And, 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 you know, when you do that, you bring that together. And we're very lucky now. Because Nadia joined our team. We have another user researcher. We have another trainer that I changed on. But that value of being willing to listen and be wanting to help makes all the difference. So, Brilliant. Yeah. It's a really common value in the NHS as yeah, well, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and so on. And I think something else that's coming out from you is about valuing people and, and uh, their yeah. expertise and insights in all different forms. Yeah. And, um, and it's really, you know, really heartening for me to hear that. Um, Liz, um, I mean, you've got um, obviously got a, a clear commitment and passion about, about user-centred uh, approaches and user experience. Um, and obviously, you also have a national perspective, well, international perspective, actually. <laughs> but on a national level, you know, how does, how, you know, what's happening at a national level in comparison with this very good example we're hearing here? What's the, what's the picture across the, the piece? I mean, so, so, so it's a really good question. And I'd probably say that it's the same in the whole space of everything we've been talking about today. So we're seeing a normal distribution curve of adoption and acceleration so you know at one end of the spectrum you've got people who are just not ready for this at the other end you've got people who are desperate and champions and amazing examples like this and then you've got the majority of people in the middle I think what's really exciting and what I've heard also today is that bell curve is shifting to the right so what was normal what was innovative is becoming normal and I think that that's what's really exciting um, and the other thing just mentioned, what I loved about that presentation and the work that these guys are doing is that it's iterative. It never stops. Mm -hmm. So you understand the problem, but what we also understand is that our populations, patients and healthcare systems keep changing, as does the technology. And so as our attitudes towards technology changes, we have to continue to ask the, ask the question about the problem that we're trying to solve. 
That's brilliant. Um, I think that you brought a bit of quality improvement into the, into the, into the mix there, didn't you? And I just wanted to ask the audience a question. How many of you are um, involved or interested in quality improvement? Quite a few. And how many um, are practicing user-centered design? Or yeah, so it's really interesting, because I think that's the next move, really, is to bring those two, two things together. Um, on, the, on the sort of user experience, user research side of things, I'd really like to hear a little bit more from Nadia, because obviously is clearly an expert in this area. You know, what, what advice have you got for people who aren't at the innovative end, end of the curve, um, who are really interested and want to learn from, from your experience and your knowledge? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you, Roz. There's lots of people and resources and reach out. Like, you've seen a lot of people today talk about user experience research and solutions design. They're a friendly bunch, by and large, <laughs> myself included. I'm not unfriendly. Stop. Uh, please reach out. Please look for resources. Like, I could talk your head off about, like, amazing books, about amazing case studies and examples. There are so many tools, and it's very much pick and choose. Pick the ones that work for you. Pick the ones that you're finding most effective. Things like interviews, they're great. But there are deeper skill sets involved in learning about probing questions, where the interviews take place. I know things have to be done virtually, but just open up the can of worms and enjoy the experience. I know that sounds like you wouldn't, but they're gummy worms in this metaphor. Um, <laughs> reach out, look for things. It's honestly, user experience is so much fun because it gives you permission to just go and be with people and learn from them and ask them questions and experience a whole different side of the coin please if you need somebody to give you permission i'm giving you permission like go and do these things make time for yourself to go to places and just be there make observations and everything is useful in some way drawing floor plans you might not think that that tells you anything but maybe it does maybe where the laptop or the one computer or the computer on wheels is located it's actually a really big indication as to why people aren't updating patient records because it's too far away from where the nurse's station is or something like that. Everything is valuable. Everything is interesting. Be curious. Be excited to find out more. And reach out and talk to people like myself because I'm a big, huge nerd for it and I love to talk about it, clearly. So, yeah, hit me up. Thanks. I just love your sound bites. Open the can of worms and enjoy it. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm going to open the can of worms now and ask the audience if you've got any questions for our, our brilliant panel here. Um, do we have the microphone? Yes. Um, just um, the lady who's sitting third row on the right. Thank you. She's right up there quickly. She's got a burning question, I think. Hi, uh, my name's Munwar. I was smiling when you said uh, can of worms. <laughs> because my, my question does open a can of worms. Um, so I really found it insightful, um, especially your panel um, using young people. Um, fascinating because we, I'm actually a CEO of a small charity in Wolfen Forest. We do a lot of work with older people and young people and how do we do intergenerational work and include people. So... But now I'm going to talk about my lived experience quickly before I ask you the question. So I'm an Asian Muslim woman. Um, how do I, how do we, not I, how do we change the cultural mindset, which is very much about me thinking, okay, how do I know that I will be included on your table? How, I, what will you do? to make me feel that I can be on your table? And I ask that question because I'm really fascinated to hear your answer. And because I do feel that people like myself often don't realize that we could be around that table. It's not because the table of people don't want us there. It's because we, and I say this because I work with a lot of Asian people in a similar sort of senior role, and I see this quite often. Mm. My daughter is 17. She's on a youth panel. She's been on a youth forum since she was 14, and she's making decisions. She's been on the Barbican Youth Forum uh, panel, and she's actually on a London youth um, panel. But that wouldn't have been me at age 17. So I'm going to give you that question, because I think you're going to give me a really interesting answer. 
Thank you. Uh, um, can I just intervene a little bit before you answer? Because my answer to you would be, could you tell me, actually? And I think that's the, the key here, but I'm going to hand over to you to, to have a first go at okay. it. <laughs> I'll say a couple of okay, cool. okay. And then you go. Uh, thank you very much. That was fantastic, and thank you mm. for sharing your experience. Uh, I would say in the first instance, everyone deserves a seat at the table. There is no exception to that. And as Ros has said, I don't know, but you do. And I always think in these examples, we can't just expect people to come to us because they won't. It's up to us to go to them. Where are the places that people are converging? Community groups, religious um, centers and hubs, um, you know, youth, youth groups. Where, where are people? Where are the people that we want to include to make sure that they feel that their voices are being heard? So it's about going out and finding out and us putting in the effort. We cannot expect people to come to us. I am a very inherently lazy person. I don't do anything. So I want to make the effort for other people to make it as easy for them as possible to be included. Thank you. I, I, I just wanted to add, I think I, everyone deserves to but I do think it's those in power who have to make the space at the table. And I think that's, again, that power dynamic that a lot of people don't address. Um, building on what Nadia said, it is actually about going to that place. And I'll use an example. So one of the things that in the NHS, and I was new to the NHS when I joined in 2020, I joined and I have found it really interesting sometimes the real hierarchical structures that can come about. And there's lots of nodding going on. <laughs> and I think what was interesting for me, and it still is, and actually right now we're doing, a, we're, we're doing numbers of projects where the only way we can actually understand what is needed is by actually going out and walking that walk. And one of the things, and the amount of times I've heard people say, oh, I'm just an HGA, it doesn't matter what I think. Oh, I'm just a cleaner, it doesn't matter what I think. Oh, I'm just this. No, it does. Because your impact is so powerful. And as I said, it's actually changed some of the way we do things when we rolled out and implemented and engaged. And it is about, as Noe says, going there, but also being willing to listen. Also, as there's the people at the table already, being willing to learn and adapt. So you'll go into a situation, you might think, oh, I'm going to do this today. Actually, there might not be the space to do that. So how do we work with you to create that? So I do think it has to be a really dynamic model. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's not much more I can add, really, but I will just add one other thing. Um, if I reflect back, so my initial career was about 22, 23 years in the NHS. And this wasn't even something that we talked about. You know, I mean, I've been outside of the NHS, but still working with the NHS for eight to nine years. And what really heartens me is we're actually having the conversation. And what I've seen over this last 12 months is people are not just talking about the problem, but we're seeing activities to move us to action. And that, for me, is really exciting. We're not there. It's not 100% it's not right. But I think we all have a voice, and we all have to use it. So in, the, in that question, I thought that question was brilliant because you're asking a challenging question, but we need to discuss it. And then we need to action and do something mm. and then learn quickly what works and what doesn't. Did you, uh, do you want to respond as well? Yes. Yeah. Good. No, it's not a response, it's a different question. Oh, can I, can I just slightly... Um, um, thank you very much for asking that question. I think yeah, it's really you. important. Um, and it's important that we acknowledge the issues around power and, and exclusion and, and voices that are not being heard that really should be and should be at the table. Um, and I think there was some action that Liz and I can do, actually. If you're interested in speaking and being at the, this table, um, at, um, the September Het Show, and, sh and sharing your, your, your knowledge and amazing. insights, I think we, could, um, we can do that. We can make that happen if you're interested, because I think you, you've got something really important to say. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Um, uh, Julia, would you like to ask a question now? Yeah, a quick question. I know I understand, Nadia, that you said not all solutions are digital, but do you have an example of uh, a digital health solution outcome having gone through this process of 
uh, user-centered design, uh, particularly around you know, patient care or chronic care. That's a brilliant question. Thank you ever so much. Um, if I may talk about COVID experience, it's my old role, sorry, Alex. Alex is my manager, by the way. If I do badly, I'm gone. Um, <laughs> so I think- I think you're on for a promotion at this rate. The NHS, <laughs> <laughs> um, during COVID, uh, I think we all had to adapt uh, very quickly. I think that's a, f a fair statement to make. Um, User-centered design, for me personally, became uh, paramount to what we were doing. Uh, and my skills of being a person who just has a com computer glued to their face ever since they were a child uh, came in incredibly useful in that time because suddenly digital became the most important thing to us all. So um, an example that I can give is when I was working very closely with GP practices and care homes. This was, you know, March, April 2020, when everybody was shifting to digital. Uh, and we, uh, I was working in, primary, in the primary care space at that time, and a GP said, please, can you just help us use Teams? Now, Microsoft Teams now is second nature to us, right? We all know how to use it. We get sick of it because we've seen it every single day. The GPs didn't know how to use it. They couldn't get it set up. The NHS version of Teams is, was different back then, like the first iteration that we had of it. Care homes don't know what the heavy is. It's different, wildly different. And some care homes have got dedicated IT people, some don't. It became really, really crucial for GP practices and care homes to have conversations about the person, the people who were at the care homes, the, the GPs who were trying to take care of people. So I helped get GP practices and care homes up and running in this one PCN, um, and they were responsible for five different care homes. This enabled clinical MDT meetings to happen, which are still happening to this day, um, in a way that had never happened before. And it wasn't just conversations about like, can I lend you some PPE, like all this kind of stuff. It was like genuinely person-centered care in real time, right there and then. We went, I, when the pandemic started, I was working um, uh, in an arm's length body in a, uh, an AHSN, uh, an academic health science network. So I wasn't you know, involved in the front line in services. I wasn't seeing patients all of that much. It very much depended on the projects I was working on. And the GPs told us what they needed help with. And we just did that. And that is discovery user-centered design. That's where you listen, where you don't say, I'm gonna do this for you, or you know, I think this would help. We genuinely, I just said, what can I help you with? And that's what we did. And they went and they took it and they ran with it. And now I think a lot of MDT meetings and clinical decisions are happening via these Teams meetings where everybody can just dial in beyond the pandemic, um, which was really heartening to see. I hope that's a sort of good example. That's something that's just like very close to my heart because it was a really important project that I enjoyed working on. So I'm just, uh, oh, do you want to, does anybody just, else want to come in? Yeah, sorry. The only thing I was going to add, and I suppose is, is something we're doing now, actually, in our RD care homes. So, sorry, and boys, we also have um, RD care homes and short stay breaks. And one of the things that we were finding is that um, a lot of the service users who live there um, suffer from epilepsy on top of other conditions. And what's been interesting is we went out and we started that process of the full scoping. So we literally went out there saying, what are you seeing? What is happening? And they have technology in there at the moment that hasn't been working. And unfortunately, it was actually a serious incident because of that. And when we go, um, have gone out and we've been working that progress with them, we have designed the solutions around them going, what do you actually want? What is the outcome you're trying to achieve? So the outcome, the overarching outcome for them is to have, when a seizure happens, we want to be there so that we can respond so that we know that we need to give them the medication because some people need it in five minutes, some people Right, so that's what we're aiming for. But also, we're aiming for that the staff are able to use the technology in a way, because what they've got currently, they can't use, so they've got pages. They can't read the pages, they can't see the pages, it doesn't tell them where, um, where it's coming from. So starting from that, we've then worked it backwards, and we've gone, these are the solutions we've found, what do you think? And we've actually gone through a whole trial period with them. So we've walked that journey with them apart, and every time they reiterate and they say to us, this hasn't worked. Okay, so actually with this you can do this. Do we change the forms? Do we change the technology? Do we change the training? And it's been that creative approach. And on that one, 
the LD directors has actually now decided they want to roll this technology out across every single care home. But going back to what Nadia said earlier, every single care home we're treating as a new um, project and start a new user research and design because same piece of kit, they need for totally different things. And if that's that reiteration process. Uh, context matters. Yeah. <laughs> um, did you want to add anything to that, Liz, before I... No, okay. I mean, I mean the, the only thing I'd say is what, what you hear there is it's not just about the technology. As you say, it's the context. It's helping people think through the problem that they're trying to solve rather than thinking of the solution. First, I mean, we do that all the time at Orca. When we work with anybody, we're not just saying, oh, this is a good technology here. We're saying, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Who are you trying to solve it for? In what context? And then apply the right technologies based on the evidence base. So, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I'd just iterate what, you, what you've said, basically, which is um, fantastic. I just want to do a check-in with the audience. How many questions have we got left? I know there's two here, three. And I, I was uh, conscious I was looking that way and I wasn't looking at you guys. So, um, so I've got three, and, and that's probably it, I, I, I think. Um, so, no, sorry, quick comment. I was just saying to what you say, I've been in the NHS since 1990. And just nowadays, yes, it has progressed much more. But so many times we are included in the panel because we are a woman and yeah. possibly Asian race, or black, but have no power to say anything. It's just somebody there, yes, we have tick marked the box. And mm -hmm. that's more distressing and insulting than not being included in the panel. Mm -hmm. um, and I get very emotional about it because this has happened. I don't know what others' experiences are, but I, think, I hope things progress better. That's all I want to say. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think, and I, I, I think that's really important for people to hear, so thank you so much. Um, would you like to ask? Uh... Hi, guys. Oh, you've got. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> one, two, three. There's one, two. Uh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no. Hi. Uh, you, you focused a lot on the uh, the staff and how you're engaging with them, but I'd love to hear any stories you have about uh, engaging with the patients and the the health population. Mm -hmm. And as a segue onto that as well, has COVID assisted in the adoption of video? So, do you have a wider access in the last two years to groups? And then following on, just for Liz, um, I'd love to hear about any uh, trends you're seeing in app developers to service the health population from home a bit more. Thank you. Are you starting with that, Liz? <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. Yeah. yeah, I'm very happy to. So I think, you know, I mean, we all know that COVID has been a massive accelerant for digital, not just digital health, but digital at large. Um, when we look at digital health, the first thing to say is we've seen a significant increase in more people using healthcare technology. So 25% more people now download digital health technology every day since the start of the pandemic. And we've been able to track trends not on just the increase, but where we've seen the increase. So it'll come as no surprise that mental health has been become a real focus for people. And if we think practically, that is no surprise because we know that more people are experiencing challenges with their mental health. And unfortunately, demands always outstripped capacity. But right now, it's even more. And we, did a, we actually just had um, a paper published around COVID digital health trends, which is freely available and, and you're welcome to see it, which really details some of this. And it also details certain demographics and where in the country we're seeing that. So um, what's really interesting is London is a real hotspot and it's significantly outstripped every other part of the country. Now, the next question is why is that? Um, and how do we enable everybody to have access? Um, the next part of your question was around new innovations. So um, just an interesting um, reflection, really. What we started to see around October, November, December of the first year of the pandemic was increase in searches for long COVID symptoms, so fatigue, migraines, etc. What we then started to see in the marketplace of digital health, January, February, March, was this massive accelerant of new technologies coming to market to support those user problems. And I think what I'm also seeing generally is a better partnership. So we're seeing more of the healthcare system, people, patients, healthcare professionals talking about the problem and then innovators responding to the problem 
rather than starting with a solution and trying to fit it to a problem. So I think we're in the right direction. Again, as everything, this is a journey, uh, but hopefully that gives you some insight. Thank you. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. If, if, you, if you want me to send it to you, just email. Um, Did you want to? I think just uh, going back to you were asking about how we've engaged with uh, persons who use our services. And I think it's a really good question. It's really interesting. And it's something we are very much learning as we keep doing it. So we keep learning. Um, we recently um, have been engaging with our um, inpatient wards with regards to and persons who use the services on the wards. And one of the things we're really keen to get is, is feedback from persons who use our services and persons who live experience. And it was really interesting because we've been trying to set up focus groups for some of our um, products because we are trying to scope some new um, technology for them and to understand what they want. And we've handed out surveys because that was actually how we were told to do the best way. We don't actually think that was the best way at all. And it's been that learning, because it's not just us that are doing the learning, it's actually the ward managers and matrons. It's helping them create that space. We rolled out ORCA um, to our children's services during the height of the pandemic. So we um, started rolling out ORCA in 2020, it's 21, with the focus primarily on children's services. And one of the things that we really sh um, struggled with, even though people online, you think kids all have access, they don't all have access. So there is a massive issue with digital um, exclusion there, and people don't think about that. But also, when trying to engage with those young people to get their views, we managed to put together focus groups via Teams, and we did them via Zoom, and we were going, what's the best way to do this? How do we engage with the charities and our um, volunteer sector? What we found is that they had such impressive input to us. I mean, they were able to say to us, this is what we see, this is what we do. And we are um, going to organise to go back out, and we're actually in the, phase, we, um, to do the next round, where we're going to go back out again and go, right, we've tried this for a year. Have you found it helpful? What do you want us to improve? How do you want us to um, do better here? And uh, that engagement is so important, but it is a journey that we are very much learning as we go along. Because there are groups, there's carers groups, there's person with lived experiences group. But again, it goes back to people have to feel comfortable in being able to give their opinion. So it is creating that space for them. Um, thank you. I promised you a question. So if you'd like to ask it, but um, could you answer really quickly? Because I know that we've got quite a time table and a really interesting conversation to come. Um, hello, I'm a GP um, from the Northeast. Um, I work for a GP federation and I'm a clinical lead for quality improvement and community engagement. And I want to work with you. That's what I'm here to say. And how do I do <laughs> that? Okay. Um, yeah. So, but I just want to like, <laughs> no, seriously, like, yeah. how do I, so this is a, this is a trust you work for, the Surrey yeah. and yeah. Borders Partnership. Forgive my ignorance of how all of this works. Um, but you said that before that you had GPs phone. Was that when you worked for AHSN? Yes. Right. So, but I'm open to collaborations now still, though. We really? can be friends. We can all be friends. We are friends. Yeah. <laughs> I'll come and find you afterwards. It's just, yeah, there's so Brilliant. many things one to do with staff and patients and projects. Yeah. And that we would absolutely love I would love that. like yours. I would so. love that. No silos. One NHS. There we go. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank to you. be honest, I'd like to work with you as well. I think you're, you, you guys are please amazing. Do. More friends, and, uh, please. Um, so thank you so much to our panel for being open and honest and informative and all those things. And thank you to the audience for the really important questions that you were asking. Um, yep, <laughs> give, them, give them a clap. Now, if, if you could